But now we will kick off with the next track, which is diversity and inclusion. These keywords have been really close to latitude and it really shows. If you take a walk around the venue, you will actually encounter 60 different nationalities and people from different ethnicity, gender and age. And in this track, uh, we will cover three panels, uh, all of which approach the topic slightly differently. To kick it off, please welcome to the stage the amazing Anisa Osman Britton, expert in the field of DEI, founder and the reporter of Sifted. She also recently got awarded MBE in King's Honor. Please welcome, round of applause. I love this stage. This is the stage we were on last year as well. It's always very fun. So hello, my name is Anissa Osman Britton. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm the founder of a coding school for women called 23 Code Street. I write for Sifted, which is how many of you will know me. Um, I'm an investor, very, very small time, do lots of angel things. And I write about sex and the South Asian diaspora, because who doesn't like to talk about sex? And I just think in this world and this tech industry that I've worked in, I've figured out my personal mission is at this intersection of impact, tech, and capital. And if you look at those three things, kind of what is the line that goes through all of it is inclusion. If we don't have everyone at the table, none of those three things work. So this is why we decided that this year at Latitude, we were going to have one hour of an inclusion track to talk just about that but we're bored. I don't know about you, but we go to all these conferences and we hear there are not enough women. I see enough women. We hear that there's not enough funding for women. We hear that there are no people of color in tech. There's no pipeline. No one wants to do maths and science at university, but all I hear when I hear that is that's kind of bullshit. So we want to look at this from a fresh perspective. And today we're going to talk about things a little bit differently. We're going to hear from three VCs who are already investing in underrepresented founders. They have money, so go speak to them if you're trying to get investment. We are going to be speaking to three founders who are working and really focusing on niche target audiences. These are not charities, don't get it twisted. You can have impact, you can do good stuff for the world, and you can still be profitable. And then finally, we are going to be looking at the role of government in creating inclusive workspaces. We already have things like parental leave, but what else can government be doing? So our workplaces think about all of us. So I just want to leave you with one really final point before we invite up our panel. The unicorn narrative can be tiring for some. Well, when I say some, I just kind of mean me. And I think it's because some of the pathways to get to unicorn status has involved things like exploitation of our resources, of our people. It's involved burnout. How many people have burned out working at their companies? So there must be a way to do things differently. If you've been to some of the panels over this week, we've heard from climate tech companies. We've heard about patient capital. We've heard about profitability over growth. And these companies are often known as like zebra companies, slow capital companies, and often known as lifestyle businesses. A few years ago, if I said lifestyle business, a VC would laugh at me and say, sorry, excuse me, what? You're focusing on profit over growth. But this economic downturn has changed how we all think about startups. But what's really funny is no one's talking about where they've learned those lessons about profitability. It's from those zebra companies. It's from those B companies. If you read the recent Sifted article that Amy Lewin wrote, it's very good if you haven't already. And a lot of those companies are founded by underrepresented founders. So before we get to the next crisis and decide we should learn from these people, why don't we learn from them now to make our businesses better? So saying that, um, there are going to be a QR code here as I am modeling. Um, please ask questions. There are great people on stage for the next hour. For example, my first panel who are chatting already backstage lots. They are all very excellent, fiery people. Uh, so I'd love to invite Christian Tooley, who is the founding GP of iCubed, uh, an investment fund investing in queer founders. You're going to come and sit next to me here, if his bag didn't already show you who he invests in. Um, not that I'm being 
<laughs> homophobic. We've got Chanel Anser, who is a partner at Cornerstone Partners. Um, she invests in black founders. And we have Trin from C Ventures, who invests primarily in women. And we're going to be talking about why they invest in underrepresented founders and why you should be doing that too. So please give them a warm welcome. These are comfy. Hi, friends. We're sat really far apart. We are. It's not as close as we've all been this week. It feels like we've all been in each other's laps. <laughs> That's Sorry. very true. It's very true, very isn't true. it? We've all had a lot of fun. This is um, authentic. It's very authentic. It feels very worky, doesn't it? Yeah. All of us in our fun outfits, though. Right. Um, so I wanted to set the scene a little bit before we get started. So according to Atomico State of European Tech, there were record levels of funding in 2021. Going into 2022, then the economic downturn and things kind of changed. But in that time, what was noticeable, very noticeable, was that distribution didn't really reflect the numbers that we were seeing 87% of all VC funding in Europe went to all male teams. Uh, the investment in all women team went down from 2% to 1%. Mm -hmm. There was very little data around what happens in any kind of intersectional lens, whether that be queer, whether that be black, whether that be people of color. Um, so knowing this <laughs> and knowing some of these ridiculous big headline stats that we see, knowing also that other investors aren't looking at this space, LPs aren't that interested, future round investors aren't that interested either. It all sounds terrible. Yeah. Why did you choose to invest in queer founders? Very good question. Um, so I think for me, the answer is threefold. So firstly, I identify as queer and intersectional myself. Secondly, from all of the startup advisory work that I've done working directly with queer founders, I've heard stories firsthand of people being told, oh, don't come out yet, get your funding first. Or they've been told by some VCs, oh, we already made a queer investment this year, we shouldn't make another one. So it, I'm in this space because people still see it as a tick box exercise, and they don't genuinely believe in the potential of certain founders and put them in certain boxes. And I genuinely also believe that which is a term we've coined at IQ, is that they are intersectional incredibles. Like, we should be investing in these communities, not just because they're underfunded and underrepresented, but they are underestimated. There's a lot of potential there that their life experience brings, and that's why I choose to invest in them. I love that. I think we should start saying underestimated instead of underrepresented. Chanel, I introduced you as Cornerstone's partners, but you're also uh, raising your own fund. If anyone is an LP, you should definitely go <laughs> chat to... Actually, go chat to all three of them. Chanel, why did you choose to invest in, in Black Founders? If I'm being completely honest, when I joined Cornerstone Partners, um, it's because I'd worked in financial services space for about 15 years and was sick of being the only person that looked like me in the room. Even when I opened my own company in 2017, working with my clients, I was still the only one that looked like me. And so I joined Cornerstone Partners mainly because I wanted to, as Christian said, you know, double down on the opportunity because I consider it to be a missed opportunity um, as opposed to kind of being upper, underrepresented or, you know, a need to kind of bridge the gap, which we need to do, but I hate kind of <sighs> leading in with a sorrow story to try and drive people to invest. But then actually when I stepped into it, I actually I realized how much work needed to be done and how phenomenal the, these founders were in this particular space, right? You know, there's so much data out there that says diversity fuels innovation, right? Um, and diverse teams kind of perform well above kind of standard av uh, market average. And so why wouldn't you? Ultimately, we're all in the business of money. And so if you want to make profit, you have to invest into innovation, right? And innovation comes from diverse people. So that's why I double down in this space. And it's really interesting when I first started out in the industry 12 years ago, <laughs> there was only data on how women outperformed and we're suddenly seeing actually yes. the ethnic diversity numbers are starting to come out. It is led US first, yes. but we're slowly seeing numbers come into Europe, which is exciting and yeah. hopefully gives the LPs a bit more of a kick up the butt to get going. Uh, Chin. 
Yeah, very similarly, I, I recognize the, the need of diversity. But um, I've spent most of my career uh, as a founder and investor in a room full of men. And um, I've sat on numerous investment committees and I realized the biases that exist in venture capital. And as soon as I saw how many women were passed on throughout this journey in the investment side, I started to advise them a lot pro bono to support them on still getting access to that capital. And then I realized there's a huge opportunity here. 98% of venture capital firms are not backing female entrepreneurs. There's a huge opportunity here whilst I was working very closely with them. But to be honest, personally, I would say that we need a systematic change. And in order to create a systematic change, we need to take action. Because we want to see more women as role models for little girls who think about their future careers and there shouldn't be uh, an option for men and women to go towards different paths of their careers. And in order for them to have these role models, we need to create an environment where women can thrive and they have a support system, they have access to capital, they have access to network, which are the biggest barriers for women to thrive. So that's, that's the main reason why I started C Ventures and to drive more capital to, to female founders and create that support network. You've each mentioned either gap or the opportunity size of this. What do the numbers really say? Is there enough pipeline for investing in these niche audiences? Christian, you're nodding and smiling at me, so we're <laughs> going to come to you first. Go on. Uh, so I think people always go down the pipeline um, argument, but unless you're actually going out and reaching out to these communities, um, you're never going to find that pipeline. Naturally, the most privileged people are going to get funding first for your initial networks for affinity bias. But there is... Can you explain affinity bias for people who may not know what that means? So affinity bias is, is pretty much all the time unconscious. But if you're, say, um, a white Stanford grad engineer who moved into VC, you're naturally going to be connected to people within that network. And you're going to connect with someone else who's from that similar background, um, which isn't anything vicious, but it often happens. So if you want to invest outside of that, you do really need to go beyond your initial networks. And mm. particularly for queer founders, I mean, there's bags of data now that shows close to 50% of Gen Z identify as queer. Mm. When we're thinking about queerness and what the future of certain communities and where economic growth is going, like if you're not being inclusive and investing in those communities, then you're not investing in the future. And there's actually a study in the US, um, very interesting, longitudinal study over seven years that showed the cost of not having LGBTQ plus inclusion can account to up to 1% of a country's GDP. Mm. There's a university-led study across seven years. So when people say pipeline, initially, like, you may not see those people straight away because you're not connected to those communities. But that's when you have to reach out and do the extra work and maybe even, to an extent, encourage queer people to join the entrepreneurial space. It's the same thing when people were saying, like, oh, there's no women coders, so I can't hire them. Mm. Then we had this whole, you know, lesbians who tech, women who code, and it changes. Chinese who code street. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, yeah, that mm -hmm, one as well. Mm -hmm, thank you. <laughs> Chanel. So, yeah, we were faced with the pipeline question a lot when we were raising for the fund at Cornerstone. So we went and self-funded a report. In the UK, another organization called Extend Ventures put out a report. Google sponsored a report um, and partnered with um, Andy Davis from 10 by 10 to put out the black report. So when we talk about black and ethnic minority founders, there's tons of data that completely dispels the question or hypothesis that we have a pipeline problem. As Christian said, quite often, let's be honest, if you're in VC, you're lazy. A lot of us are time poor. And so you go to your networks or you look at deals that are sent to you by your friends in the ecosystem, right? Um, and there is that affinity bias, right? Where typically your immediate ecosystem or echo chamber is a reflection of you. Mm -hmm. And quite often it isn't diverse. So you need to be intentional, right? The problem, there isn't a pipeline problem. Let's just be honest, a lot of us are being very lazy. But if you step outside of your comfort zone and be a bit more intentional, you will find that there's 
thousands, right, thousands of phenomenal founders from diverse backgrounds that you should be betting on and should be putting money towards. Um, you know, when you talk about the future, you talked about Gen Z. You know, I talked about stats from McKinsey that says 33% right, drives more profit than, you know, all white teams, all white male teams. Mm. Really and truly, we're in the money business. So really and truly, you need to follow where the money is. And if the money says it's an in innovation and diversity, why aren't you following it? I think this is such a key, important part. I often find when we do conversations like this, people go, oh, yeah. <laughs> they're But doing charity work. I hate that. I hate that honestly really irks me. Um, it's, not, it's not an impact cause. Investing in women, investing in people of colour, investing in the LGBTQ plus communities, we are not impact groups. Um, we bring diversity of thought. The founders within our different communities bring diversity of thought. We bring innovation. We bring the future. Um, and so innovation is not an impact cause, is it? So... Why would you put us into these boxes? Okay, so I'm in the front row. Love it. <laughs> Chin. Um, yeah, I love talking about numbers, especially when it comes to female entrepreneurs. And I hear there's not enough pipeline. Um, so let's look at the numbers then. 51% of European population are women. 34% are self-employed. 30% uh, are uh, startup founders. Um, and actually in the US, it's very similar. 42% of businesses out there are founded by women. And a lot of them are just small businesses. Not all of them are tech businesses. But the pipeline is there. The, 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 the hunger is there. Women are there. So I think going back to what Chanel just said, it is, it is more about working through the pipeline. And uh, I just looked at the numbers recently, and there's actually an increase from within one year, there's an increase in scale-ups founded by women or diverse founding teams of 70%. So this number is actually increasing, and I think it's because we've, we've created this education on the market already, and there are more opportunities. There starts to be more role models out there, so more women are getting into entrepreneurship. But when it comes to actually managing um, this pipeline and getting access to it, I always, uh, when I speak to other venture funds, I always kind of challenge them on understanding where is this problem? Is it that you don't see enough of female entrepreneurs or diverse teams, or is it that you see enough but you can't pro pro process them within your pipeline. You can't get them from the first call to an IC, or is it perhaps at the end of the funnel where you can't get them from IC to an investment? Mm. And then you need to start looking at, maybe you don't do enough work to actually get access to different communities, as, as Chanel mentioned, Or perhaps it's the unconscious bias that Chris just mentioned, uh, because there's gender bias, confirmation bias, all sorts of different bias in venture capital. Or perhaps you just don't have enough women or diverse uh, team members within your team. And that comes back to more diverse thinking and understanding certain problems, certain markets. So I think um, each firm should look at also where do they get stuck with that funnel and then take action based on that. Something that I find... I hear more and more is that big VC funds, oh yes, ask questions up there. I have an iPad here, I'll do something with it at some point. Um, do ask questions. I'm hearing anecdotally that bigger funds are saying, are seeing black founders come through, they're seeing queer founders, they're seeing women, disabled founders, and they're like, you know, this isn't for me, but you should go and speak to Christian, you should go and speak to Chanel. Do you think that sometimes you're the scapegoat for big bigger VCs, and how do we change that? How do we get them to see that this is mm. also for them? It's their opportunity as well. So I do think to an extent, larger VCs can be lazy and rely on partnerships that can be quite one-sided, mm. particularly when it comes around to certain holidays, like, oh, it's International Women's Day, let's do office hours for women founders or... And not give uh, them any money. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's Pride Month. Let's change our logo to this. And I personally think the reason behind that, and um, you touched upon it earlier, is that at the IC level, um, the actual people making those final decisions, no matter what the rest of the company looks like, is still majority white, male, straight, cis. And like we use this term called queer capital, and it's basically a, a triangle. At the top, you have LPs, then investors, then founders. So it doesn't matter how many diverse founders you find, the further up that triangle you go, there's less diversity. And 
you can't empathize or understand the need to empower those communities if you're not there at that level. So how to change that? Like, you need diverse voices on your investment committee, even if like, they don't work for you. I know some VCs that will bring people from different communities into their deal flow sessions, being super transparent and saying like, okay, well, this is a founder from this community. Can you help us understand uh, the, the problem, the solution a bit better? And just having those different voices is really the only way you're going to make sure those investment happens and it's not just a tick box exercise once a year. So I guess the other side of that and the question that I get asked a lot is, what are the challenges? If it isn't pipeline, why is it we're struggling to raise funds as emerging fund managers in this space? Why is it that some of our investments aren't going on to raise follow-on funding? What are the challenges? I mean, this panel is called Why You Shouldn't Invest in Underrepresented Funds. We all know we should, but let's talk about this honestly. What is the downside of it? Let's go with you, Chanel. Only because you're looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> The downside of investing in underrepresented founders. Specifically black founders or um, Cornerstone? I think so Cornerstone was the first black-owned investment group in the UK. And so that came with a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. And so, as you mentioned, every investor in our ecosystem, you know, would send founders to us to fund. We had a very small fund at the time before we done a larger close last year. Um, there's an infinite, a small amount of money that you know, could go to investing in these companies. And so, yeah, there, there is a lot of pressure associated with that. And you know, you're often seen as kind of the pillar or the savior, you know, fund that will invest in everyone that is black. And if you do not invest in an in a underrepresented founder, it's also a negative signal to the market. Mm. Um, because other VC funds will say, well, oh, well, Cornerstone didn't invest in them, so something must be wrong. But let's all be real, you know, we all don't sing from the same hymn sheet. We all have our thesis, different investment criteria. Um, and ICs, as you know, everyone in the stage has mentioned, it's down to a very small group of individuals. And so... You know, I think there is weight associated with feeling like you have to back everyone, but knowing that you can't. Mm. Um, and I think there's also weight associated with kind of being a signal to our peers in the market, our investor peers. And why you shouldn't invest in underrepresented founders. Don't invest in underrepresented founders because you think it's going to make you look good or if you're trying to send a signal to the market to say, hey, it's you know, International Women's Day, or it's Pride Month, or Black History Month, and so, hey, we're showcasing that we support these different groups. No, because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And then if you are doing that, I'm saying, why are you in the game of venture capital? We're in a game of making money, as I keep saying. Mm. Um, so look at your internal processes, your policies, and really challenge yourself to you know, push not only the investment team, the core investment team, the IC members, and even upwards to your LPs, right, to ensure that the policy mandates and pushes you to act differently. So, yeah, just to summarize, I've said a lot, but don't invest in marginalized or underestimated or overlooked groups because you think it's the right thing to do. Invest in these groups because you think there's an opportunity to make money. You didn't say a lot. You articulated it beautifully. I would have stopped you if you did. <laughs> Finn, did you want to add anything? Um, I would just say that a lot of funds, all these big name funds as well, are under pressure right now to, to back more um, underrepresented groups. And I think they've actually realized that they're missing out. And us who are actually focusing on more niche communities, in their, in, in their opinion, they see that we're actually discovering talent that they don't. Mm. So I see an opportunity for funds like us to actually get first access and better access because they know where to come, for, to, come to this talent. Mm -hmm. And we actually work very closely together with some larger funds who write much larger checks to do follow-on rounds in the companies that we invest in earlier stages. So I think there's a massive collaboration opportunity there. And we've started to see that a lot uh, with, with C-Ventures. Why would, wouldn't you invest in underrepresented founders? I'm sorry, but I don't know why wouldn't you. <laughs> um, you should, uh, to not miss out on the returns. 
So there's a que- oh gosh, Jesus. Um, but there was a question here. Sorry, not blaspheming on stage. Um, there's a question here that I think is really important, which is if you look upstream. It's fine. Let's roll. So everyone went to the after party yesterday, right? This is just the uh, the side effects. I didn't even go. I don't have an excuse. Um, we'll leave that there. I needed a new phone anyway. So if you look upstream at LPs. What do you think about the fact that they often have hard rules about not being able to invest systemically into niche communities, into niche groups? What does that kind of say to us? And can we speak to the LPs? Is the issue actually with the LPs? Are we passing the blame on? Uh, that was a question from the audience. I think it was a, a good one. Thank you, Gleb. But it's, it's not really about not being able to invest. Um, the only problem there is positive discrimination. And I, I've spoken to government institutions, larger government funds, and that seems to be the main issue. And then they recommend us to re-message the thesis. Mm. So it's, 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 um, it's interesting. And I think it's the education or the, the, the lack of ability to react to it. And I think it takes, just takes a little bit more time when they are under pressure to move. Um, so that's, that's what we've experienced. But when we talk about family offices, ultra high net worth, funds of funds, the plenty of them out there who have a lot of appetite for underrepresented focused uh, thesis. Um, I think the main question always comes to the pipeline and can you show there is enough pipeline? Chanel, I want to ask you this because I think it's really interesting that you had the angel network that came into that. Do you think that changes then the narrative of, or maybe is it the way of getting around the fact that LPs may be still a bit, a bit dubious of investing slightly more niche? Absolutely. So version one of Cornerstone was our own money. So we were our LPs into our own fund. We came, 20 of us came together with a the small amount of money um, to us at the time, being sort of early 30s, it was a lot of money to us. And we said, you know, we're going to back our own. And so we did. And to your point, Anissa, we kind of used that as a test case or case study to say, hey, look, these are all the amazing companies that we've invested in. This is how they have grown. You know, this is the opportunity and this is why you should invest in the fund. And it did work. It wasn't easy. Um, but it definitely did help. I think if we kind of go up the value chain and we go up to LPs, I, I think it's, it, there's a lack of education. Mm. And we've all talked about it. There's kind of affinity and association bias. You know what you know. You know what you're exposed to. So if you aren't seeing many winners, you know, without being intentional and going to look for them, that are from groups that are different to what you are used to, right? Um, understandably, right, you will question. Say, well, where are the winners in this space? Why should I double down and give you money for your fund to invest in these groups? Um, so I understand where those questions come from initially. I always challenge it and say, you know, stop being lazy, just step yeah. out and go and look. Um, but not all of them want to do that when you are sitting on a uh, kind of 50 billion pension fund. Mm. Uh, you don't have to, but you should, because ultimately you have a duty to your shareholders and your stakeholders to make their money work from them so that they can live a nice life when they retire off their pension investment. So you want to go out, right, and invest in the future so you can make those returns. So there's your business case. Yeah. If you're stuck in time, Right. No, so I'm going to rush you very Sorry, and you're performing below the S&P, then what are you offering that's different? Love that. Christian, your other job, which isn't on there, is you're a venture expert at Bain. And I'm just really curious, have you found that that conversation has changed? Or have you found that you're still pushing against a default, a status quo that we, we think we're so far ahead of? Sorry, could you reword that? Yeah. <laughs> um, the question is, are things changing in the consultancy world or do they still think we should invest in the default man? Um, so I, because like my background has been consulting in the corporate space, I think they're a lot further ahead because of the, the big investment banks and law firms, I'd say around the turn of the 20th century, started seeing the value in this. Like the early consulting companies like 
Mine, Bain, McKinsey were very instrumental in pushing for queer rights in the US and having the same same sex rights across different like packages in work. So I, I do think they're a lot further along the curve. Um, and I personally think that VC is a bit like finance in the 80s. So there, there is a lot they can learn from there. And I think corporations naturally have also had a tighter relationship with policymakers and, and government. So they're able to push on the, lit the litigation side. So I do think that VC plays an important role, economically empowering communities. It's only one piece of the pie. Um, if we don't have like legal rights, especially now thinking in the UK and some places in Europe, like trans rights, queer rights, migrant rights, um, that's like baseline 101 stuff. So another thing that VCs, because they have money, could be more vocal in, is pushing, pushing for that type of change. Um, and the only thing I'll add on the LP thing, which is a plug for LPs and VCs in the room, we have a survey out right now specifically asking questions on do you invest in emerging fund managers and on DE&I. Where can we find that? Um, you can come to me and I'll send you the link. But <laughs> it's, it's online as well. So it's partnered with Mount Sign Ventures, Tech Barbecue. So, yeah, help us get more data. Not that we need it, though, because... We do need it. We, we need, need it. more data. Yeah, we do. More data helps more people cross the line and we're trying to convince the people True. on the other side. Yeah. Yes? No? Yes. yes. I mean, we've had data on black founders for ages and there's still been no material difference. Not to end on a pessimistic note. I love how that's what we're going to end on. <laughs> I'm going to end on more data is good. Uh, okay. Christian, Chanel, Trin, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. And we ended on time. Perfect. Yay. You're going to have to walk off that Yay. way to a clap. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.